What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Sinestro Core War. <laughs> God, this story is so good. <laughs> this story is nuts. It's absolutely insane. This is just the prelude too. This isn't even like the main story. This is just the prelude, and it's absolutely insane this is one of the most bonkers stories that i've ever read in a good way in a good way it's, it's crazy in a good way it's it's crazy and it's exciting in a good way let us get into this <laughs> let us cover this so the cool thing about this is, is like right off the bat we just get like the motivations of sinestro right i mean it's the uh, sinestro core you know the the yellow lanterns we get his motivations right off the bat and that's the cool thing about this because the first thing we're told is that like sinestro he absolutely abhors any Anything that does not fall in line with what he considers to be like structure and regiment. And we knew that, right? Like we knew the whole, with the whole story of Sinestro, with him falling from the Green Lantern Corps, all of it was rooted in the fact that where he was the greatest member of the Green Lanterns, you know, the greatest of their kind, one of the most capable, he eventually succumbed to fear. The reason being because of the fact that as a Green Lantern, he believed that there needed to be absolute order. There needed to be absolute structure. And it was always with the smallest thing. It's like the quintessential example of Batman about why he doesn't kill. All you have to do is justify it once and then you can justify it a thousand times over that's the position of sinestro like he took his ring and he said we're going to inst uh, institute absolute order and absolute structure on his home planet and then in turn uh tried to influence that across the universe now of course that led to the to the guardians of the universe realizing what it was that he was doing casting him out of the green lantern Corps, and forcing him really to just kind of run into retreat eventually becoming a bad guy and the most notable enemy of hal jordan what this tells us is that initially he or i guess initially where he believed that he was doing the right thing, which is why he was able to invoke willpower the way he was, he eventually realized that it was fear. You know, it was fear of the fact that things, that he would basically lose what it was that made him who he was. You know, that he would lose control over his sector, that he would basically fail in his mission. Not only that, he came to believe that because of the fact that he was able to institute the kind of order that he did, that came from the fact that people were afraid of him. They feared for him. And so that's when he began to realize that fear is the best motivation for forcing people to do the things that you want them to do. And that's the coolest thing about this, is because because remember, the emotional spectrum exists out there as this sort of disembodied thing that basically is fed by all beings in existence. But it's only until recently people learned how to tap into it. The Guardians of the Universe learned it. But in terms of other people, it's this little thing that happens every once in a while. You know, for example, Atrocitus, his whole family slaughtered, his entire sector is massacred by the by the Manhunters, and he in turn, in his rage and in his anger, is able to tap into the emotional spectrum of rage, which in turn allows him to create the Red Lantern Corps. Of course, we'll get into that, you know, all that stuff later on down the line. But for Sinestro feeding into his own fear, you know, really kind of feeding into the concept of fear itself, he's in turn able to tap into the fear aspect of the emotional spectrum and then effectively make himself the first of the Yellow Lanterns. Now, this is so cool because remember, over the course of this whole idea of the Sinestro core growing, what we're told is that this little segment of, of Sinestro basically forming his core is basically a backstory. It takes place in the past. What ended up happening is in the modern day, we know that right now, or at least at the time the story is being told, that he sent rings out to basically grow his Sinestro Corps army. And one of these rings had approached Batman and said, you have the power to instill great fear. Welcome to the Sinestro Corps. And then ultimately cast him out once it realized that he had used the Green Lantern ring of, of, uh, of Hal Jordan. And that's why we covered a lot of that stuff because those things were so important and they set the stage for things that would come later on down the line. They were small moments. They were tiny little things that took place, but they all built to this greater thing. And that's how Jeff Johns wrote his Green Lantern story is a thing would happen in a panel or something would take place in a page that would seem out of place and totally unnecessary. And then like five or six stories later on down the line, the entirety of a set of events hinders on what happened in that one page. And that's why this is so cool, man. Let me tell you something, man. Jeff Johns, man. This guy knows how to write stories. <laughs> but that's why it's so cool. Because remember, you know, with the whole secret society, as it was formed by Lex Luthor after, I guess, before and, and during the events of Infinite Crisis, Sinestro had served as part of that group. Now, of course, we also saw him, you know, basically serving alongside Eobard Thawne and so on and so forth. And the reason why that matters is because following the Sinestro Corps ring approaching uh, approaching Batman and trying to bring Batman into its ranks, uh, Batman basically went and told the rest of the Justice League, something's going on. I was approached by the equivalent of what looked like Hal Jordan's ring, except it was yellow and it said, welcome to the Sinestro Corps. Hal Jordan, of course, intervenes, begins investigating. And that was the whole idea of what it is the Green, I'm sorry, the, the Justice League is doing with Eobard Thawne. They're basically tracking down all these leads on what the Sinestro Corps is and what the Sinestro Corps is about. But no one has any answers to that. No one knows the answer to this 
Chris Riddle. Now, of course, again, transitioning over to Kyle Rayner, keep in mind with him, we know he's Ion at this point in time. Now, explicitly what that means, we'll actually find out in this story, which is what's so cool. But all we really know is that as the Torchbearer, he basically holds a place beyond all the other Green Lanterns. He doesn't require a ring in order to do the things that he does. Not only that, he's basically the sole person that's going to be able to bring back all of the Green Lanterns and the Guardians of the Universe should they all end up being destroyed. Now, again, why he's able to do that, we'll get into that in this video. But him basically showing up uh, coincides with, you know, a little bit of a conflict with a couple of Lanterns, but the arrival of this green or this Yellow Lantern ring, which again says, you know, you do not have the ability to instill great fear. You have not been chosen <laughs> and basically takes off and ends up going and finding a suitable host. Now, of course, Kyle Rayner follows him along this path, or at least follows this ring to its most logical conclusion. But at this point, we jump over to the Guardians of the Universe. And so, of course, remember, all this stuff takes place after the events of Infinite Crisis. And so for those of you guys who are just joining my channel who never went through Infinite Crisis, you'll find the videos down in the description for a more detailed explanation. But the long and short of it is that Infinite Crisis served the purpose of restoring the multiverse. That was basically it. You know, Crisis on Infinite Earths saw the multiverse being eliminated in its entirety and, and was basically replaced with a singular universe called New Earth. Infinite Crisis saw the multiverse brought back. Now, this does invoke the question of what happened with one of the most notable members of the multiverse, which again, we'll get into that as we get through the story. But the fact remains that the way the multiverse stands right now, at least as is explained to us by, you know, the guardians of the universe is that it's really just kind of standing on a knife's edge in the sense that you have the main DC universe. And then on top of that are all these different earths. And so if the main DC universe earth were to be destroyed, it would send a cascading event that would basically wipe out the multiverse. But the other half of this is remember, we dealt with the return of cyborg Superman. And all we really knew was that the cyborg Superman had been defeated at some point in time. His mind had basically been stuck inside the source wall, the wall that basically uh, keeps the entire DC universe contained. But from that point, he basically resurrected himself, restored the Manhunters. Uh, again, you'll find all this stuff down in the description. And then in turn, basically began creating an army for himself. Now, of course, the Manhunters served as the group that the Guardians of the Universe used before they created the Green Lantern Corps in the sense that the Manhunters are basically just robots. Remember, the Guardians of the Universe sat down and basically said, look, if we're going to be the police force, so to speak, of the universe, meaning we're going to look around the universe and do everything we can to keep it safe. We have to be impartial. We cannot allow ourselves to be governed by emotion. And so what we have to do is basically separate ourselves from the entirety of that ideology. And so they basically purge themselves of all emotion. Now, what this does is it basically says, look, with them going through and creating the Manhunters, the Manhunters basically went awry, they rebelled, the Manhunters were decommissioned, quote unquote, and then the Green Lantern Corps was created in place of the Manhunters. And so that's where the entirety of the Green Lantern Corps comes from. Now, following the events of Infinite Crisis, when the multiverse was restored and the mind of Cyborg Superman was freed, allowing him to basically recreate his own body, what this meant was that Cyborg Superman had knowledge of the fact that the multiverse was back. He had knowledge of what was beyond the main DC universe and all the other universes that were available. Now, the reason why this matters is because of the fact that with him showing up, this basically begins the process of fulfilling the prophecy of Blackest Night. Now, the prophecy of Blackest Night is a Amazing. And we're going to get into like the Blackest Night story, dude. That's, oh my God, man, I'm do Blackest Night. <laughs> <laughs> if God was writing comic books right now, that's what it would look like right now. Blackest Night is so good. It's one of the best stories that I've ever read. Like in general, absolutely mind blowing. Like, oh dude, it gets, it gets so cool. Anyway, the whole idea here is that this begins a process of fulfilling the Blackest Night. And we're literally told what it was, you know, a face of metal and flesh shall, shall speak the secrets of the 52, the 52 new universes. You know, fear will rise, willpower will gather. Basically meaning that the Sinestro Corps will begin to rise to prominence and the Green Lanterns will have to respond, and a war of light will unleash the truth behind the power of the ring. This is the entirety, the entire basis behind the prophecy of the Blackest Night. Now, again, this is considered to be forbidden knowledge. This is something they don't talk about. It's, it's the forbidden fruit. You know, it's not something that the Guardians of the Universe delve in. Now, of course, the reason why this is, is, is considered to be forbidden is because of the fact that, remember, with Abin Sur having been the Green Lantern that passed his ring on to Hal Jordan, Abin Sur was told of the prophecy of the Black Blackest Night by Atrocitus himself, the leader of the Red Lantern Corps. And so because of all that, again, that stuff's covered in my video on uh, the secret origin of Hal Jordan. But because of that stuff, because of the fact that the Guardians of the Universe don't believe it's real, they basically consider it to be nonsense. They consider it to be an instance of Atrocitus the Red Lantern playing on the uh, the, the idea of Abin Sur in the sense of basically making him scared and stripping him of his willpower. Because remember, a Green Lantern can only really remain a Green Lantern and use their ring to its full capacity so long as they maintain 
willpower and they don't allow themselves to succumb to fear. And so the guardians of the universe basically looked at this prophecy and said, these are the ravings of a madman. Atrocitus and Abensur were fighting one another. Atrocitus said, oh, there's a prophecy of the blackest night, hoping it would erode the willpower of, uh, of Abensur, which in turn would lead to him being unable to defeat Atrocitus. That's basically how the guardians of the universe believe this. But what we end up finding out is that that's not true. The prophecy of the blackest night is very much true. Now, again, one of the things that we also end up doing is we basically pick up with Guy Gardner kind of racing off and talking to Salak, who's basically, again, this sort of uh, voice for the decisions that are made by the Guardians of the Universe. And uh, of course, you know, Guy Gardner basically says, look, Sinestro's back. Sinestro has returned. We have to figure out what's going on with what he's, what we're calling the Sinestro Corps. We don't really know what it is or what it's about. Well, in the middle of this huge gathering with all these Green Lanterns that have been brought together by the Guardians of the Universe, suddenly a Sinestro Corps ring appears. And as it's going around hunting for hosts, it immediately realizes that Kyle Rayner's there. Now, this is cool. And this is why this is so interesting. When it comes to the Green Lantern rings, they're very linear, right? Like they don't really have like a mind of their own. I mean, they do to a degree, but like if a Green Lantern gets killed, the ring will automatically go out and seek a new host. It'll say, you know, Green Lantern of sector, you know, three, four, one, six, or something like that, deceased, seeking a new host. And it'll just race off and it'll find a new host. And it'll basically come across someone that says, you have great willpower, the power to overcome great fear. Uh, you have been chosen. Welcome to the Green Lantern Corps, something along those lines. And it'll whisk them off to Oa to begin the process of being trained. Now, of course, at that point, they can basically rebuke the ring and say, I do not want to be a Green Lantern. And the ring will choose somebody else. But in this instance, the Sinestro Corps ring, when it's hunting around, immediately recognizes Kyle Rayner as somebody unique among all of the Green Lanterns. It captures him and it whisks him away to the antimatter universe to the planet of Kord. Now, again, one of the things that, that we need to, to talk about here for a second are the Kordians themselves. This is really Jeff John sort of drawing on a lot of the old school Green Lantern stuff in the sense that even way back in the day before Jeff Johns came along and before he revamped a lot of these origins, really telling the backstory of Sinestro, what we knew was that where Sinestro was the greatest of the Green Lanterns, somewhere along the line, he got his Yellow Lantern ring. And what happened were the Cordians were basically the ones that fashioned the ring for him. This ring that basically fed on the color yellow. Because remember, back in the day, you know, back before Jeff Johns took over, back in the 60s and 70s, really even the 80s and going into the 90s, there was no answer for why it is that, you know, Green Lanterns are weak to the color yellow. It's just, they just are. That's just their weakness. It's just the way it is. And so with Sinestro having a Yellow Lantern ring, that allowed him to do everything that a Green Lantern ring did, but basically defeat a Green Lantern because the Green Lanterns couldn't counter the color yellow. Uh, in turn, this basically was established as the idea that the Weaponers of Core, these people in the antimatter universe, basically a different universe from the main DC universe itself, they basically fashioned this ring for him. Now, of course, a lot of this was included, changed, or eliminated with regards to what it is that Jeff Johns is doing now. But the fact remains that when Kyle Rayner is whisked off to the planet Core, to this home base of where it was, that Sinestra was confined to, when he became a bad guy as a Green Lantern and was held, you know, in a prison of sorts by the Guardians of the Universe, he arrives to end up seeing that all these Cordians have been totally eliminated. And the reason why is because Sinestro now has his army that measures in the thousands. There's thousands of Yellow Lanterns everywhere. I mean, he's on a planet surrounded by Yellow Lanterns. He's in what's probably the worst situation that any Green Lantern could be in. And so because of this, Sinestro immediately immediately grabs Kyle Rayner and says, we're taking you. You are going to be a host for Parallax, the entity of fear, the embodiment of fear. Now, this is the process in which Jeff Johns begins moving away from the idea of using metaphors of saying like, you know, the embodiment of fear and different things like that. And actually gives us physical ideas, physical constructs where Kyle Rayner fights back as best he can. In the end, he's just not able to pull it off. I mean, the, the yellow impurity is basically gone. I mean, that was an explanation that was given really in Green Lantern Rebirth, where it was established that Parallax is the living embodiment of fear in the entire entirety of the universe. And Parallax had basically been defeated at some point along the line and was imprisoned in the Green Lantern Central Power Battery, which is where all the Green Lanterns get their power from. The reason for the Yellow Impurity simply comes from the fact that Parallax was inside the Central Power Battery. Eventually, when, you know, Hal Jordan more or less lost his mind, when he went through, he became, you know, he declared himself to be Parallax, all that kind of good stuff, and uh, he was possessed by the Parallax entity. The idea was that when he destroyed the entirety of the Green Lantern Corps, because Parallax had bonded with Hal Jordan, Parallax 
was no longer in the central power battery. And the reason why this matters is because following the defeat of Hal Jordan and Kyle Rayner basically going through and resurrecting the entirety of the Green Lantern Corps and the central power battery, this basically brought them back without the yellow impurity, without, you know, parallax inside the central power battery, which is why they don't have a weakness to the color yellow. That's why all that takes place. So for some of you guys, hopefully the light bulb's going off. You're just kind of like, oh, okay, I understand what's going on because that was basically what was taking place. It was the idea of Jeff John sort of, you know, fixing everything, clearing everything up and setting the stage for where we are right now. And so the crazy thing about this is that while we have all these different members of the Sinestro Corps who have basically left the planet Cord and are assaulting Oa, the homeworld of the Green Lanterns, in the middle of this whole, uh, whole conflict, suddenly some 30 or 40 Green Lantern rings just go whisking by, talking about how their existing lanterns have all been killed. And the question is, well, who was it that did it? You know, if somebody went through and killed all these Green Lanterns in one shot, then who was it that pulled it off? Well, we end up transitioning over to the science cells only to find out that Superboy Prime is gone. Man, that's one of the coolest things about this because remember, in our videos on Infinite Crisis, we had talked about how Superboy Prime had basically become a bad guy. You know, he had become a villain. And in doing so, at the end of the entire conflict, he was basically encased in a giant box of pure willpower by the Guardians of the Universe and was kept in stasis, was basically kept in the presence of red radiation to keep him from being able to use his powers and keep him from being able to escape. That's how he's been held in prison this entire time. And so the idea seems to be here that essentially Superboy Prime has been given a yellow lantern ring. He's become part of the Sinestro Corps and that's how he was able to escape. So the cool thing about this is we switch back over to Sinestro and that's one of the really interesting things here because Sinestro begins the process of talking about how for him, the entire popularity or really the entire idea of the Sinestro Corps is predicated on the notion of instilling fear. And so what they're doing is they're basically going around and gathering all these different people who basically have the power to instill fear in virtually anybody across the universe. Superboy Prime with the, the, the swath that he cut through the superhero community. I mean, remember during Infinite Crisis, Superboy Prime took on the Teen Titans, Young Justice, and the Justice League all at the same time. I mean, that guy was stupid overpowered. It was crazy. But the fear that he engendered was enough that he caught the attention of Sinestro and said, that guy is a must. Not only that, with regards to Kyle Rayner being this, you know, being Ion and having the ability to basically resurrect the Green Lantern Corps, the reason for why this is done is because he's the host for the embodiment of willpower, the Ion Whale, basically the Green Lantern Whale. That's what he is. And that's how he's been able to pull off what it is that he's been able to do. We didn't know this. This is something that was basically introduced to us. This is like a, a fresh piece of information. Prior to this, all we knew is the Guardians of the Universe just said, you will be the one who will bring back the Green Lantern Corps should we all die. And we didn't know why. With regards to him being the host for willpower, what this means is that now in this instance, that this is how he's able to resurrect them. He's literally the embodiment of willpower itself. But if he's the host for pure willpower, he can be the host for anything else. It's like taking the battery out of something and putting a new battery in. And that's exactly what Sinestro does. Sinestro says, all you need to do is feel fear. If I can strip you of your willpower, if I can pull this living embodiment of willpower out of you, then you have nothing to feed on anymore. You have no way to keep your will going. So all I have to do is put something in its place. Now at this point, it's eroding whatever willpower Kyle Rayner has left. And this is when Sinestro begins a process of feeding on all the terrible experiences that Kyle Rayner's had over the course of his life. The fact that his original girlfriend was killed, the fact that his mother died, all these instances and in saying, these are all your fault. You know, and so again, what this whole, whole idea is basically saying is, Kyle Rayner, all the worst experiences you've ever had in your life are your fault. And by making him experience all these things, it in turn begins the process of eroding the willpower of Kyle Rayner, which ultimately makes him the perfect host for Parallax. And that's what happens. Parallax is let loose and the living embodiment of fear across the universe merges with Kyle Rayner, making him the new Parallax. And so what we end up doing is, of course, we have Kyle Rayner basically asking the question, when do I get to kill folks? And this is, <laughs> this is when Sinestro says, you know, we'll start that soon. In the meantime, we have to marshal our forces. And so what we learn is that in addition to Superboy Prime, who looks amazing as a Yellow Lantern, by the way, the Anti-Monitor has been inducted into the Sinestro Corps. The Anti-Monitor was resurrected with the return of the multiverse. Remember, the Anti-Monitor is intrinsic to the multiverse itself. If it's there, he's there. It's just the way it works. And so the Anti-Monitor has effectively been inducted into the Sinestro Corps due to the fact that with the Anti-Monitor's desire to basically absorb and obliterate all life in existence and recreate everything in existence, he instills fear better than most anybody else. There's also Cyborg Superman because of the fact that he instills so much fear as being one of the most notable villains following the 
death of Superman. So again, the ranks are being grown, the numbers are increasing, and what this does is lead into this insane conflict that's really one of the greatest stories ever told, like in the history of comic books. Man, if God was writing Green Lantern right now, is what it would look like right now. If God was, man, let's have some church right now. If God was writing Green Lantern right now, this is what it would look like right now. This is one of the best stories that I have ever read. God, this story is amazing. This story is absolutely insane. Uh, it is so cool because it, it takes like what we think about superheroes, right? And like it, it turns it on its head. It takes everything that we think about superheroes and just like flips it over. Like the crazy thing about superheroes, and, and it happens to a degree, but the crazy thing about superheroes is that like historically, speaking there's like some enemy that shows up and they're like oh my god this enemy who's really powerful like there's no way we can beat him but somehow like they come together against impossible odds and they win they save the day uh-uh no that's not what happens that's not what happens in here the whole first book of sinestro core war is just like run <laughs> flee for your lives <laughs> it's the coolest thing ever it's just like <laughs> find a place to hide just go somewhere anywhere that's not here like it's one of the coolest things ever because remember in the prelude video we talked about how like the sinestro core was like always in the background the sinestro core was always like mustering up its forces in the background there were just times when it would just show up in different stories we would just have like a page somewhere and it would just say you have the ability to instill great fear welcome to the sinestro core and then it would, that would be it it would just go away it would just vanish and the idea was that it was building towards something big man is it a sight to behold <laughs> It is amazing. God, this is so good. The whole thing is that when the Sinestro Corps was officially formed, they like raided Oa. I mean, it was just like, just ripping apart the Green Lanterns. And that's what's so cool about this. Cause like Superboy Prime escaped and like Cyborg Superman's gone. The Anti-Monitor is allied with the Sinestro Corps. Imagine all the worst things that could happen with the Green Lanterns. That's what Jeff Johns writes in the story in the first part of the story. Because initially it's all just recuperation, right? I mean like, you know, on Oa, it's the idea that they were just totally wrecked by the Sinestro court with no expectation that it was coming and that's the great thing about this is no one knew it was coming no one had any idea it was there they were just you know meeting together and then suddenly it was bam everybody just shows up these these members of the sinestro court just show up and just start crushing everybody and so at this point it's just like okay fall back let's see if we can't get our forces together let's see if we can't figure out what's going on but in the midst of all this like it's it's something like 55 56 the number just keeps going up the numbers of lantern slain just keeps going up and that's the whole thing because what what they say here is that like on Oa, the, the assault of the Sinestro Corps is basically stopped because they were there to capture Kyle Rayner. I mean, it wasn't expected, but when they found him there and, and found him as the host for the willpower entity and the emotional spectrum, they snatched him up, took him to took him to Cord, you know, in the antimatter universe, and then they backed off. But across the universe, Green Lanterns are dying everywhere. And that's what makes this so cool because it's like this huge encompassing opera with everything that we see going on in this story right now. Keep in the back of your minds, Green Lanterns across the universe are just dying it's one of the coolest things in the world like you just see these numbers just just cranking out you know occasionally it's just you know 67 lanterns dead or so on and so forth you see rings fly by green lantern of sector such and such deceased searching out viable replacement or whatever the case may be now the other half of this is the book of oa and that's what makes this so cool because remember the book of oa serves as both a general guide as well as a chronicle of everything that's gone on and the whole history of the guardians of the universe the green lanterns all the forces they faced sinestro falling from grace all that kind of good stuff but the idea is that there's also the prophecy of Blackest Night. Now, the cool thing about this is that if you just suddenly jump into Sinestro Core War, you can still kind of, you know, get a general idea of what's going on, but it's a lot more fulfilling and there's a lot more meat and potatoes to it if you go through and start reading the stories beforehand, which is why I always tell people, if you're going to read Green Lantern, read Green Lantern Core and read Green Lantern, go all the way back, you know, really to, to Rebirth and just work your way forward with regards to the whole Hal Jordan and Green Lantern mythos. But what this does is it tells us that while all these Green Lanterns are sitting around and dying, the the Guardians of the Universe are more or less playing politics. Now, we kind of expect that to be the case, right? Like we expect with the Guardians of the Universe that they're going to be playing politics, they're going to be doing their thing where they're going to be engaging in bureaucracy and talking about what they should do and all that kind of good stuff and how things should happen and function and so on and so forth. But remember, the original idea of the Guardians of the Universe is that they would cast their emotions aside. They would basically say, we are devoid of all emotion whatsoever. Now, of course, again, we know right now, just because of DC Rebirth, the last will and testament of the, uh, of the First Lantern, we know all that deals with the fact that they were basically 
specifically taught how to uh, how to harness the emotional spectrum by Volthoom and began to realize that tapping into their emotions was too extreme. And they basically cast them aside and made themselves just totally devoid of any real feeling whatsoever, believing that strictly rational thought would be the only way to go. But the idea was that with Abin Sur being the Green Lantern predecessor to Hal Jordan, which is to say the guy that basically gave Hal Jordan his ring, Abin Sur had been told by Atrocitus, the head of the Red Lantern Corps, of the prophecy of Blackest Night. Now, the funny thing about this is the question that, you know, that, that Ganthet and Sade have, because remember, the Guardians never usually take names, so it's basically Jeff John's way of saying these two are going to play a very important role as we go on throughout the Green Lantern mythos, but the argument that Ganthet and Sade have is, look, if the rest of the Guardians consider the prophecy of the Blackest Night to be nonsense, if they consider it to be just this sort of a scare tactic that was used by Atrocitus for the purpose of weakening the willpower of Abin Sur through fear and then using that to defeat him, then why in the world did the Guardians of the Universe record it in the first place? It would be like if I came to you and I said, oh man, like the planet's going to blow up tomorrow. You know, and you're like, whatever, that's nonsense. I don't believe a single word of that. And then you started making arrangements in case the planet did blow up. If you didn't really think it was real, then why are you making these arrangements in the first place? And so what this does is it basically reveals to us the idea that while a lot of these different guardians are more or less purged of their emotions, on a very fundamental level, on a very personal level, they're terrified. They're terrified of the idea that the prophecy of Blackest Night is real, that it's true. Because if it is, it means those guardians are all going to die. It means the Green Lanterns are all going to die. It means there's going to be nothing but death and destruction across the universe forever and ever and ever and ever. And so again, it's the idea that they're basically faced with their own mortality. And that's one of the reasons why I love this little piece of writing so much with Jeff Johns, because it begs the question, if you were a race that had basically been around for billions of years, and then were suddenly forced to face the idea that you're not as omnipotent as you think you were, and that you can die just like anybody else, would you really be prepared? Or would you be absolutely terrified? Are you so used to living that you can't imagine not being alive? And so again, with help from Ganthet and Sade, Hal Jordan is basically informed that, of course, Kyle Rayner is being held on cord, the home base of the of the Sinestro Corps, at least at this particular point in time. Now, keep in mind here, Hal Jordan is kind of like this Green Lantern that fell from grace. He's still considered to be like the best of them in terms of what he can do, how he uses his ring, the, the fact that he's like, you know, first one in, last one out. That whole element makes him one of the greatest Green Lanterns among them, but there's a lot who don't trust him. Because remember, back during Emerald Twilight, following the destruction of Coast City by, uh, by Mongol and Cyborg, he felt such a rush of fear that he was basically taken over by Parallax, the embodiment of fear within the emotional spectrum. He went forward as a villain. He basically laid waste to the entirety of the Green Lantern Corps, killed the Guardians of the Universe. For a lot of Green Lanterns out there, they look at him and what if it happened again? And that's one of the crazy scenarios. That level of trust just isn't there anymore. And it never really will be. I mean, the Lost Lanterns, the ones who are believed to have been killed by him, only to have been taken by Cyborg Superman and used for experiments, eventually being rescued by, you know, Hal Jordan and Guy Gardner and so on and so forth, they specifically will never trust Hal Jordan again. But they constantly keep reminding of everybody of the time that Hal Jordan became a bad guy, the time that Hal Jordan was evil, you know? And so what goes on here in the middle of all this is that when, you know, Guy Gardner and Jon Stewart and Hal Jordan go to charge their rings in order to break the inter uh, interdimensional barrier and travel to the uh, antimatter universe and access cord, we suddenly end up finding out that the central power battery's basically been booby trapped. And that's the coolest thing because for years, back before Jeff Johns took over, the idea was that Green Lanterns were just weak to the color yellow, but nobody ever knew why. It was just something that they, you know, they were just weak to it. It wasn't until Jeff Johns came along and said, the guardians of the universe discovered Parallax to represent the very embodiment of fear. They can find him inside the central power battery, which in turn is the reason why Green Lantern rings were weak to fear in the first place, weak to the color yellow in the first place, Parallax was eventually freed, the yellow impurity went away. What it did is it created this kind of scenario where it's like Parallax always had a back door into the central power battery. Not only that, you also have to keep in mind, Kyle Rayner was the host for Ion. He was the host for Willpower. He's part and parcel to the Green Lanterns themselves. And so while I wouldn't go as far as to say that the central power battery is like an arm or a leg for Kyle Rayner, it's not that much intertwined in who he is. He's still very much a part of the fact that it basically came back. And so he's almost able to just sort of enter and leave as he wants to, but creating this sort of booby trap is perfect because what it means is that any Green Lantern that goes to charge their rings will get a direct shot of fear into their bodies. Because remember, the central power battery is this massive source of energy, this massive source of willpower. So it would be like you sticking your finger in an electrical socket, except instead of electricity, you feel a rush of fear. And that's exactly what happened with Hal Jordan, where he's normally able to overcome great fear, where he's normally one of the best of the Green Lanterns, he immediately experiences this massive rush where he's basically forced to relive the death of his own father. And what this does is it allows Kyle Rayner to appear as Parallax and basically begin the process of taunting Hal Jordan while whisking him away to the uh, to the antimatter universe of Cord. Now, something else to point out here 
is that we get a couple instances here and there of Green Lanterns who are either trying to make their escape, who don't really know what's going on, who aren't aware of the fact that the Sinestro Corps is attacking. And once they do show up, they're just totally obliterated. And that's the crazy thing about this, because remember, the universe is a big place and it takes time. When you have the Sinestro Corps launching a surprise attack, then it takes time to basically marshal forces together, to get information out there, to let people know what's going on. And so by the time some of these Green Lanterns realize what it is that's happening, they're suddenly ambushed by like 50 members of the Sinestro Corps and they have no hope of escape. Now, that's something else that I want you to take note of here is because we end up having Sinestro traveling back to his home planet of Karuger. And the reason why this is so important is because of the fact that he basically visits uh, Saranik Natu, the girl who took up, you know, his own lantern, his own Green Lantern ring, and became the Green Lantern of Karuger. Now, with her character being elevated to this position, it brought in one of two possible scenarios. The first was that she never wanted to be a Green Lantern in the first place, just because of the fact that she remembers when Sinestro ruled over Karuger and how dictatorial he was in his policies. But the other half of this is that it terrified her because she believed that people on Karuger would view her the same way, that people would look around and say, oh, we we have a savior up there in the form of a Green Lantern who's not Sinestro. Like, she'll lead us to the promised land. She'll give us a better society. She'll solve all of our problems for us. And that's what she was terrified of because one of the things that's kind of hit home when it comes to the Green Lanterns is that the be the people that are best suited to be Green Lanterns are the people who know how to confront their own problems and know how to deal with their own problems, hence the necessity of willpower. The willpower to overcome such overwhelming odds and cope with them as best you can. But for Saronic, her fear is basically becoming Sinestro. Now, really, at this point, it's just a matter of the nature of the Green Lantern rings and the fact that she's just not as capable of a fighter as Sinestro is. Now, when I talk about the nature of the Green Lantern rings, there's an instance when she tries to kill Sinestro. The problem with this is the ring stops her because one of the big weaknesses of the Green Lantern rings is that initially they were designed as a peacekeeping force as opposed to a war force. And so the issue with this is that where she tries to take out Sinestro, the ring immediately realizes her intention is based on hostility. Her intention is based on a desire to kill and it keeps her from doing that. And that's the reason why so many of these Green Lanterns are dying, because they're playing defense when they should be playing offense, because they don't have a choice. Their rings will not allow them to kill. Their rings will only allow them to defend. And so that's why this whole first part of the story is just running and hiding, defending as best they can, keeping the Sinestro Corps at bay, because the Sinestro Corps does not have that limitation. Those rings allow its wheelers to just kill whoever it is that they come across, especially if they're, uh, if they're Green Lanterns. Because remember, the Sinestro your core feeds on fear. It's powered by fear. What better way to, to really, you know, continue powering the Sinestro Corps than to just incite fear everywhere you go by killing Green Lanterns in front of people, by killing them all over the place. And so some of these lost lanterns try to face off against Parallax as best they can, but at the end of the day, they're not really able to pull it off on their own. And so what ends up happening is the group actually takes up residence underground. They really just kind of scatter to a couple different, uh, couple different areas, but Hal Jordan, uh, Tomar too, they actually end up taking up residence or at least uh, coming across the woman by the name of Lysa Drack. Now, if you're reading Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns uh, from, from DC Rebirth, she's very familiar to you. You saw her in the first arc, uh, Sinestro's Law. You know, she's a character that dates all the way back to Jeff John's run. And she was originally introduced as just like this chronicler of the Sinestro Corps. She basically kept the Book of Sinestro, the Book of the Yellow Lantern or the Sinestro Corps. It was just like the Book of Oa, except that it chronicled everything from the Sinestro Corps side. What this does is basically just give us this massive conflict, again, outside of Hal Jordan himself, this massive conflict from all these different lanterns all across the universe, all trying to stem the flow as best they can, but at the end of the day, not being able to hold off all these members of the Sinestro Corps. Now, of course, with regards to Hal Jordan and his guys, remember, this is not them engaging in conflict to kill. This is them trying to rescue people where they can, trying to grab those who have been captured, trying to save those Green Lanterns who are out there in no man's land that don't know what's going on or else ambushed by a ton of uh by a ton of yellow lanterns recon and contain that's all this is that's why there's action but there's really more of like dialogue because it's like what in the world is going on everybody trying to get a grasp on this situation now with regards to the guardians of the universe again what they start doing is talking about the idea of rewriting the book of oa now the reason why this is so significant is because the book of oa is designed to be this sort of guaranteed promise among the green lanterns right like it's this idea that like no matter what any green lantern does no matter what takes place their accomplishments their failures 
those who fall from grace, those who achieve great things, their recordings will go in the Book of Oa. It literally exists to just chronicle everything that goes on with the Green Lantern Corps. And so while some of these members of the Guardians of the Universe talk about rewriting the Book of Oa, the concern of Ganthet and Sade is they're going to write out the prophecy of Blackest Night. And so what that basically means is these Guardians will be tantamount to sticking their head in the sand like ostriches while all hell just unfolds around them, believing that if they just ignore it, then nothing will happen to them. But that storm's coming. Either they can face it and be prepared, or they can hide from it and be eradicated. And so the idea is that from Ganthet and Sade's perspective, it's we got to face this. Like, we got to be prepped. We have to we have to realize this Blackest Night is coming. And when it does, hell is coming with it. We have to be prepared for this. And the other Guardians are just like, no, 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 no. If we ignore it, it'll go away. And so the idea is that if they rewrite the Book of Oa, they'll basically remove the prophecy of Blackest Night, pretend like it's not there, despite knowing the fact that it will be coming the entire time. It's going to be there the whole way. Now, of course, again, back with Hal Jordan and his guys, all they really do here is just like free Guy Gardner and John Stewart. But Jeff Johns actually begins the process of going through and introducing the notion of a singular lantern wielding multiple rings. Now, something to point out here is this had not really been touched on since the days of Emerald Twilight. That was really the last time we'd seen anything like that with Hal Jordan taking all the rings of the former Green Lanterns that he defeated, you know, and just kind of using those rings for his own purposes, sort of supercharging his own Green Lantern powers. That was really the last time we had seen that. But it set the stage for what Jeff Johns is doing now, because suddenly we're going to start seeing Green Lanterns wielding more than one Lantern ring. We're going to see people like Kyle Rayner, who, who are the embodiment of all the rings. So we're going to see like all these crazy scenarios with all these different characters. Now, the other half of this is the Anti-Monitor. And really with the Anti-Monitor, at least, you know, in the inner sanctum of the Sinestro Corps, the Anti-Monitor is, of course, going through and kind of experimenting on the whole, uh, on Ion, the living embodiment of willpower, sort of, you know, trying to either torture it or gain information, or at the very least, see if it can be, you know, corrupted and transformed into something else. The motivations, I don't think, are entirely explained here, but it's it's the Anti-Monitor. So we know that whatever it is that he's doing, it's bad. It's just, you know, villain stuff. But in the middle of all this, of Hal Jordan, the other Green Lanterns, you know, those who are left, they all basically sort of race into the scene. They end up, you know, grabbing the uh, embodiment of willpower and racing off. Because at this moment in time, the perspective of the Green Lanterns is that if the embodiment of willpower is destroyed, willpower will go with it. Now, we know that's not the case, but at the time, they don't know that. At the time, all they know is that if the embodiment of willpower is gone, then there'll be nobody to resurrect the Green Lantern Corps. And that's the reason why that's so important. Because with Kyle Rayner, he was Ion. He was the host for willpower. And so when he was replaced as the host for Parallax, what that meant was that the Ion Whale was just kind of floating out there in no man's land somewhere. But if the Ion Whale's destroyed, there'll be nobody to resurrect the Green Lantern Corps. They'll all be killed off, and that'll be the end of that. And so really, one of the most important things to do is to grab the host to grab the whale and get out of there as fast as possible. And that's what they do. You know, they all basically kind of grab these things, just race off. But in these last few moments, what the Guardians do is they emerge from the central power battery from their own, you know, little uh, haven in there, so to speak. And they basically say, we've rewritten the Book of Oa and we now have new laws. Chief among them is the idea that the Green Lantern rings are now capable of lethal force. The Green Lanterns are now able to kill. And that's huge because the Green Lanterns can't believe it. They're just kind of like, wow, but what choice do the Guardians of the Universe have? When you're a Guardian of the Universe, you look out and you see that Sinestro, you know, Thal Sinestro has formed his own Sinestro Corps, his own Lantern Corps, and he's just laying waste to every single Green Lantern that he comes across. What choice do you have? The Guardians of the Universe sit down and say, we don't have a choice. If we're going to defeat the Sinestro Corps, we have to fight fire with fire. And so from this point going forward, the Green Lantern rings have now had the whole hold on lethal force. That's been been removed. The Green Lanterns are now allowed to kill members of the Sinestro Corps. Okay, so continuing our discussion on Sinestro Core War, we get into the Superboy Prime one-shot. Now, this is kind of interesting, and this story, of course, was written by Jeff Johns, but this looks like it was actually an editorial slash legal mandate, and it's really kind of a funny situation because during this time, legal arguments began to resurface between the Siegel and Schuster families and DC, because remember, they'd been suing DC repeatedly over the idea, over the rights to Superman and Superboy. But the idea was that because Superboy Prime was basically 
basically a spinoff of the Superboy concept. The idea was that all properties rooted to or based off of the Superboy idea ultimately belonged to Siegel and Schuster. And so what ended up happening is DC actually had to change the name because of the fact that they had effectively kind of won this lawsuit with regards to Superman, all things that were Superman related uh, belonged to DC. But with Superboy, it was still in contention. And so what they effectively did in the story is they used it as a way to actually change Superboy Prime into Superman Prime. Now, in truth, it's really just a name change. That's really all it is. That was the only thing that was really necessary in order to pull this off. The problem is that in the realm of comic books, you can't just simply change the name of a character. It wouldn't have made sense for him to just one day say, you know what? I'm just going to start calling myself Superman Prime. Just because of the fact that DC already had DC 1 million, that line of stories was already there. And the concept of Superman Prime was already in existence. And so there had to be an explanation that could differentiate between Superboy Prime now calling himself Superman Prime and basically Superman 1 million. And so it was kind of a cool idea in terms of how this unfolded. But what this does is it actually initially picks up with Superboy Prime as part of the Sinestro Corps visiting the grave of Bart Allen. Now, this again is really just a reflection of editorial mandates. And the reason why I say that is because Bart Allen was a character who originally appeared in 1994 and he was designed to be this attempt to sort of reinvigorate and keep uh, keep refreshing the idea of the Flash landscape. Remember, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, there was only Wally West as the Flash. And then you just kind of had newer members or I guess the return of older members that were gradually introduced as time went on. But Bart Allen was this descendant of the Flash family uh, who had basically sort of just kind of aged at an accelerated rate. But the idea was to basically provide a new iteration of the kid Flash going by the name Impulse, who could be an updated version of Wally West when he was a kid before Crisis on Infinite Earths. The problem with this was that as time progressed, and I'm not exactly sure why this was done, as time progressed, DC began the idea of basically removing his character. And this all basically goes back to the introduction of a villain by the name of Inertia. Now, Inertia was basically Thaddeus Thawne II. And the way this worked out was that in the 30th century in DC Comics, Thaddeus Thawne was a descendant of Eobard Thawne. And the idea was that Thaddeus Thawne had basically become president and it actually created a sort of hybrid clone of Bart Allen and the original Eobard Thawne, combining their DNA to create a singular being in the form of Inertia. And what this did is it allowed for Inertia to operate as the arch enemy of Bart Allen, basically being his own version of Eobard Thawne. But again, while I'm not entirely sure about like the sales or the, the whole reason why this was done, all I really know is that DC had come along and basically told the writer at the time, Mark Guggenheim, that he needed to eliminate Bart Allen. And so the story that was written to pull this off was basically a story called Flash, the fastest man alive. And what basically ended up happening here is Inertia developed a way to effectively strip Bart Allen of his access to the Speed Force, basically making him normal. At the same time, it also coincided with Inertia teaming up alongside the Rogues. And so because the Rogues are basically the main enemy of the Flash itself, according to editorial mandate, the story had to conclude with the Rogues killing Bart Allen. Now, again, I don't know if this is really character assassination. I don't know if it was the idea that DC just wanted to get rid of him. In truth, as far as I'm aware, it's just speculation. I'm sure there's some source out there somewhere that explains that, but I haven't been able to find it. I haven't been able to find any indication or any line by line explanation of why DC chose to make this choice. But the fact remains that because Bart Allen was one of the flashes who had originally defeated Superboy Prime during the events of Infinite Crisis, it created a sort of bitter anger, a bitter hatred between the two of them, especially because of the fact that Superboy Prime is terrified of speedsters. Now, the only indication of his fear of speedsters really coming takes the form of the idea that they were able to push him into the Speed Force. Not only that, the Speedsters derive their power from the Speed Force itself. And so it's not like another dimension. I mean, it is to a degree, but it's not. It's not like pushing him into a different universe. It's not like putting him on Earth 2 or something along those lines. In the Speed Force, all time is, is kind of relative. So for Superboy Prime, where he was gone for like a day or an hour or something along those lines, in the Speed Force, he was there for years. And so it's effectively kind of like this living prison where he can't access, see, or talk to anybody. The other half of this is the motivation behind Superboy Prime. Prime. Remember, he's a tragic character. The way that he was written in Infinite Crisis made him a very sad character. For those of you guys who never saw my origin video on him, he basically came from Earth Prime that was part of this huge multiverse that existed before the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. And Earth Prime in DC Comics is basically the real world. It's the world where you're sitting watching this video right now. And so Superboy Prime growing up in this universe basically read comics about superheroes. He read comics about Superman, you know, during the Golden Age. You know, Superman as he appeared in DC Comics. It's one of those weird meta commentary kind of things, but he was basically hit with cosmic energies with the energies of a comet and it granted him powers that made him equivalent to Superman. The other half of this was that because Kryptonite didn't exist in Earth Prime and because of the fact that his reality of Earth Prime was destroyed and the events leading up to Crisis on Infinite Earths, Superboy Prime basically had
had no weaknesses aside from red sun radiation. And even then, his strength level, his endurance, his speed, it was all well beyond the idea of any of the Superman or Superwomen who existed at the time. And so where he basically was kind of shunted off to a pocket universe after the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths and then returned during Infinite Crisis, of course, again, we have those videos uh, down in our playlist about DC Rebirth. You're welcome to check them out. The idea here was that he emerged as essentially a bad guy because with him growing up and reading superheroes as these beings to look up to and then seeing this new Earth continuity, this post-Crisis on Infinite Earths uh, landscape, having superheroes become darker, a little more gritty, he basically came to believe that the superheroes as they existed were not real superheroes. They were liars. They were frauds. They were tricksters. And so the goal was that when he came out of the paradise dimension, when he punched reality and shattered it, he ended up just waging this war against all the superheroes across the DC universe and literally crushing everybody. I mean, there was a point where he faced off against like 33 Green Lanterns and killed them all. It was absolutely insane. Ultimately, it took the efforts of the original Golden Age Superman and the new Earth Superman to fly him through a red sun, strip him of his powers, and then the Green Lanterns to encase him in this giant green box, one of the science cells they have, to basically keep him held. But remember, during the events of, uh, I guess, part of the lead up to Sinestro Corps War, he was freed from this and he was inducted into the Sinestro Corps proper. Now, the biggest issue about this little tidbit of storytelling here is that he still uses this modified suit that he used during uh, Infinite Crisis that's designed for the purpose, or at least seems to be designed for the purpose, to harness yellow energy. Now, the problem with this is that Jeff Johns kind of gives us this weird scenario here. When Superboy Prime used this mechanized suit or this powered suit during the events of Infinite Crisis, the goal was to basically have the suit serve as a battery pack of sorts in the sense that all Superman or all versions of Superman, Superwoman, whatever the case may be, they act as a solar battery. And so their body basically absorbs solar energy until it can't hold anymore. And once their body's supercharged, once it's fully charged with solar energy, they're as powerful as they're, as they're ever going to be. They reach the peak of their complete and total potential. What's Superboy Prime did in developing this pack was basically give himself additional solar energy, which means that he could fight longer and he could fight harder than any of the existing Superman that stood out there. This compounded the fact that he was already stronger than any of the Superman that existed out there, so he was basically a one-man army. He was just an absolute wrecking crew. Well, of course, with this armor basically being destroyed, with him losing his powers after being locked in a science cell, and then being freed by the Sinestro Corps, this suit is not exactly like the one he wore before, but it seems as though it would serve the same. Uh, the same purpose. The problem with this is that while he's going against the combined efforts of like the Titans and the Teen Titans and all these different superheroes, he keeps making reference to the idea that he's waiting for the yellow sun to come up. Now, again, this is kind of a weird scenario because historically speaking in DC Comics, the atmosphere of the Earth plays no part in the yellow sun in terms of how it impacts a Superman. Whether Superman is standing on Earth or whether he's floating out in space, the impact of yellow sun radiation is always the same. Now, the closer he gets to the sun and the longer he spins inside the sun, the more powerful he'll become. That's one of the reasons why Superman 1 million was so powerful, because he literally just stayed inside of the sun. And so his cells were just soaked with yellow sun radiation. With regards to this here, it basically looks like Superboy Prime's not nearly as powerful as he would normally be. But the idea is that if he's not as powerful as he would normally be, why wouldn't he just go to the yellow sun? sun and then show up on Earth fully charged? We don't have an answer to that question. Instead, we just kind of have to go on the idea that he's not normally as strong as he should be. But once the yellow sun comes up, it basically allows his energies to begin recharging again. Now, in truth, drawing on the nature of this story and what we're seeing with him, you know, kind of reflecting on his own life, reflecting on these moments that he's had, you know, with regards to Lori, his girlfriend on Earth Prime, lamenting the idea of the destruction of his own Earth, the idea that he basically allied himself with the Sinestro Corps just long enough to to allow the anti-monitor a moment of victory so that he could snatch it away and kill him. The implication seems to be here that this suit maybe reduces his powers or this suit perhaps blocks out the yellow sun radiation to a degree, or it's just for the sake of storytelling. It's just for the sake of giving us a chance to see him kind of talking about these moments and to see him face off against some of these superheroes. Because remember, if Superboy Prime suddenly showed back up on Earth at the same power level that he was before, he would have destroyed all these superheroes without any questions. They all would have died. And so the idea is that once we have the arrival of Karen Starr, of the Power Girl, the Supergirl, basically of Earth 2, alongside Superman and the Supergirl of the main DC universe, this leads into the three of them trying the best they can to hold off Superboy Prime. Now, of course, once the sun comes up, his powers begin returning to him in full force, and he is completely energized. And so what this means is that what little chance these superheroes had to actually win is gone. They basically have no real chance anymore. Now, in terms of evolving him from 
Superboy Prime into Superman Prime, this comes by way of the narrative that he's basically been offering over the course of the story. Because remember, his whole life is the idea that he's come to believe that superheroes as they exist in DC Comics at the time this story has been written are not actually superheroes. Because in the mind of Superboy Prime, there's no moral ambiguity when it comes to superheroes. It's we're good guys, they're bad guys, we fight them, we arrest them, they go to jail, done and done. That's it. There's no, sometimes we can bend the rules, sometimes we can break the rules, we hide things from our friends. That's not how Superboy Prime views superheroes. He views superheroes as being 100% in the right, always doing the right thing, no matter the circumstance. Now, again, back during that Infinite Crisis line of stories, that was designed to be a meta commentary on superheroes as they existed at the time by Jeff Johns himself. In a lot of ways, Superboy Prime was Jeff Johns as he was looking at the superhero world. But the overall idea here is that because Superboy Prime viewed these heroes as morally ambiguous, the goal was to basically take the place of Superman, to eliminate this version of Superman and replace him. And that's why he ends up calling himself Superman Prime, because there was a time in his history when he was Superboy Prime, but the reason for that was because of the fact that he had fought alongside the original 1940s Earth 2 Superman. That was a Superman he looked up to. He had no desire to take his place. He had no reason to take his place because that was a superhero that Superboy Prime idolized. But with the death of the original Earth 2 Superman, with him being removed from the equation, now there's basically a place for Superboy Prime to say, I am going to become the real Superman as he should be. I'm going to become Superman as a hero should actually be. Now we know just by virtue of the evolution of his character, he's twisted and he's basically lost his mind. But the fact still remains that there was a lot of moral ambiguity when it came to these heroes. And so ultimately he ends up just stripping off the uh, Sinestro Corps uniform, which coincides with the arrival of the Anti-Monitor with the Green Lanterns, so on and so forth, and simply just dubs himself Superman Prime. And so what this does is this segues directly into the second part of Sinestro Corps War, when we basically end up having Superman Prime facing off against the ultimate weapon of the uh, of the Green Lanterns, which of course comes in the form of Ion, the current host of the willpower entity in the Green Lanterns. Of course, this is actually a guy named Sodom Yacht. It's actually not Kyle Rayner, because remember, Kyle Rayner is still part of the Sinestro Corps. What this story does as we start to get back into this is it basically picks up with a character by the name of Sodom Yacht. Now, this is kind of cool because his character is really introduced to basically show us how bad things are getting for the superhero community. And a lot of this really deals with the idea of a kind of cybernetic a sentient planet called Ranks. And Ranks is basically this character that had appeared over the course of DC's publication history something like 10 or 20 times. It was never a prominent thing. And the idea here was that Ranks was basically a planet that served the purpose of kind of being a place for villains and different folks to show up in. The idea was that eventually it led to a conflict between Guy Gardner, one of the Green Lanterns of Earth, and Ranks itself, which saw Ranks defeated. And so what this did is it segued directly into Sinestro Corps War in the sense that Ranks basically allied itself with Sinestro, if for no other reason than to see Guy Gardner and the Green Lanterns defeated. Now the reason why this matters is because of the fact that the Green Lanterns themselves have Mogo. And Mogo, as crazy as it sounds, is just a giant planet <laughs> with a Green Lantern ring. And I know it sounds kind of crazy, but Mogo is insanely powerful because the abilities of a Green Lantern are directly proportional to the mass of that Green Lantern, to how strong their willpower is, the energy they can muster, and so on and so forth. And so a person like Hal Jordan, for example, wouldn't be as powerful as someone like Mogo because Mogo is basically a planet with the power of willpower just being blown in any one particular direction. And so for the most part, Mogo could obliterate virtually anything in its path. But the reason why this is important is because of the fact that Mogo is basically the forward operating base in a lot of ways for the Green Lanterns in the sense that where the Green Lanterns home base is Oa proper, basically the home of the Guardians of the Universe, Mogo serves as a way for them to just kind of travel around, for them to peruse the area, to keep their sectors, so on and so forth, but he's also a very powerful ally. And with Ranks being allied with the Sinestro Corps, this basically leads to the two of them coming into direct conflict. Now the reason why this is important is because while Mogo can use its power to totally obliterate Ranks, there's also other Green Lanterns in the vicinity, and so really it would just kind of result in collateral damage. And so what ends up happening here is we actually have Sodom Yacht alongside a handful of other Green Lanterns make their way onto ranks. Now, the thing about Sodom Yacht, and we'll get into him here in a second, he's really kind of introduced as this question of what would happen if Superman got a lantern ring, a Green Lantern ring. That's really the idea here, because remember, all of this is really hitting home to the notion of like the members of the Justice League getting in their own lantern rings. This massive war between all these different lantern cores. And so once ranks is basically defeated by having its central core over overloaded, which results in its 
explosion. Sodom Yad is of course revealed to have survived the whole experience, only for Hal Jordan to chime in with the other Green Lanterns and say that the target of Sinestro is not Oa as they believed it was. Instead, it's the planet Earth. And so what this does is it picks up with Superboy Prime. Now the funny thing about this when it comes to Superboy Prime, we're, we're kind of backtracking a little bit here. The Superboy Prime one shot sort of coincides with this part of the Sinestro Core War, but where it fits in is really kind of up to us. And really it just kind of comes almost immediately after this one particular comic that we're going to be going through here in a second. And of course, you know, I'll, I'll mention as we as we pass by where it is that it goes in. But the arrival of the Sinestro Core uh, really is just like this absolute state of pandemonium for the planet Earth. Because remember, despite all these different superheroes that are there, you know, Superman and Batman and so on and so forth, they didn't really know everything that was going on with Sinestro. That's one of the big things that we had talked about in the first part of Sinestro Core War, about how they were in the middle of a conflict and then seemingly out of nowhere, Batman was met with a yellow lantern ring that said, Bruce Wayne, you have the power to instill great fear, after which the ring abandoned him because it sensed the fact that Bruce Wayne had used the Green Lantern ring at some point in time and considered him to be tainted. But despite this one little occurrence, the Justice League didn't know everything that was going on out there in the universe. And so the arrival of all these Manhunter robots under the command of Cyborg Superman, all these different members of the Sinestro Corps, heralds just this massive invasion of planet Earth. Now, keep in mind, I mean, these aren't weaklings. You know, Power Girl, basically this alternate reality version of Supergirl, uh, Supergirl herself from the main DC universe, Superman, Batman, so on and so forth. They're all able to basically use their abilities to stem the tide of this conflict, but there's so much happening and they can only be in so many places at once. And so one of the things that actually ends up happening here is we have Hal Jordan tracking down and chasing down Kyle Rayner. Because remember, at this point in time, Kyle Rayner is basically the host for the Parallax entity. He's literally walking fear. And so because of this, where Hal Jordan is able to track him down and is able to grab him, ultimately Parallax absorbs Hal Jordan as well. And so again, this creates for a pretty dangerous situation just because of the fact that keep in mind Hal Jordan had declared himself to be Parallax way back in the 1990s during the events of Emerald Twilight. And so in this story, when they're referencing things about how Hal Jordan betrayed them and so on and so forth, it was the idea that Hal Jordan had become the host for, for the Parallax entity before. And so with Parallax basically possessing both Kyle Rayner and Hal Jordan, two of their best Green Lanterns are now off the table. Not only that, all the experience and all the knowledge that goes with them is absorbed by Parallax as well. And so it means that Parallax now knows how to counter all these different Green Lanterns. Now, of course, again, it's really kind of like this massive arrival of all these heroes, because in addition to the Justice League facing off against these ancillary members of the uh, of the Sinestro Corps, they're also forced to face off against Superboy Prime. And it's absolutely amazing the way this happens. Jumping into Parallax himself, it gives us a little bit of insight as to what happens when a person is possessed by Parallax. And so for Kyle Rayner, he's kind of in this world of darkness. And as it's depicted, it really seems to be more of like a psychological mind state, you know, more so than anything else. But the fact remains here that with Hal Jordan being absorbed as well, the two of them are basically able to use their willpower and overcome Parallax. And again, that's the weakness of the Sinestro Core is the fact that if anybody has sufficient willpower, they can overcome the Sinestro Core. They can overcome the Yellow Lantern Ring and return to their normal selves. And of course, with Hal Jordan and uh, Kyle Rayner working together, they're essentially freed of the Parallax entity. Now, of course, with Parallax intending to basically consume or, you know, possibly destroy them both, it just meets with the arrival of, uh, of, of Ganthet and Sade, a couple of the uh, Guardians of the Universe, who, of course, grab or end up taking uh, elements, or I guess really kind of splitting up Parallax, and then dispersing him among these different lanterns, which, of course, means that now Parallax is effectively held prisoner. And instead of just being in one central place, he's just kind of spread around different lanterns. So it's really just a way to kind of remove him from the landscape temporarily and allow the story to focus on everything else that's going going on. And so again, you know, kind of transitioning back to this major battle, to this major conflict, we also end up joining up with Sodom Yat himself. And again, the idea is that once everybody realizes what's going on with regards to Sinestro targeting Earth, this is when they also begin to realize about the return of the Anti-Monitor. Now, a lot of people knew about that, but not everybody did. And the return of the Anti-Monitor is huge because we're talking about a level of power that's near godhood, if not on the same level. The Anti-Monitor is virtually unstoppable, just completely indestructible. The Yellow Lantern Corps, or uh, I guess the Yellow Lantern Ring, doesn't really do much for Anti-Monitor. Really, the Anti-Monitor just kind of exists for the purpose of fueling the fear of Sinestro, which allowed him to create his own Yellow Lantern core in the first place. But really, I mean, if you were to give, you know, the Anti-Monitor a Yellow Lantern Ring, it wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't matter. I mean, he'd still have an insane amount of power. It might complement those abilities, but given the power that he has, he doesn't need a Yellow Lantern Ring. It's kind of what I'm hitting home at here. And so with him being on the scene, the Green Lanterns also begin to realize just how dangerous everything is. But this is when we cue into the arrival of Sodom Yacht. And Sodom Yacht kind of pops up on the scene and basically becomes the new host for the entity of willpower for Ion. Now, the reason why this is 
is so significant and the reason why this is so big is because this leads us directly into the whole idea of the prophecy of Blackest Night. With regards to the, the I guess, the one shot of Superboy Prime fitting in between these two little segments here, we basically pick up after Superboy Prime had fought and wrecked all these different superheroes. And the idea is that Superboy Prime facing off against Sodom Yacht is kind of complemented by Sodom talking about the whole event and running it over it in his mind and commentating and, and so on and so forth. But it also gives us a little bit of insight into his character. And what happens here is DC basically goes back and grabs the idea of a place called Daxum. Now, Daxum was basically a planet that was introduced in 1963 in Action Comics number 3. 312? I'm not going to swear to that though. But it was created by a guy named Edmund Hamilton. And Edmund Hamilton had found his claim to fame in science fiction novels. And so he was very big on writing stories that dealt with spacefaring adventures and things like that. And because of the fact that, that sci-fi had overtaken the popularity of comics of superheroes in the 1950s, it made sense that if DC was trying to reinstigate or trying to reinitiate this second renaissance of superheroes in the 1960s, that they would in turn grab science fiction writers to pull it off. And so Daxon was introduced essentially as a planet Planet that was colonized by a group of Kryptonians that had broken away from Krypton proper. And so what this did is it introduced the idea that there could be another Superman out there if he was exposed to a yellow sun. Now, the origin that was originally given, uh, given to us in 1963 was a little bit different. The one that I just kind of ran over is basically the one that we get in this particular story. But notice this conflict between Superboy Prime and Sodom Yacht. Despite the vast power that Sodom has, he's basically channeling willpower in its most pure form. He's not like a Green Lantern using his ring to to access willpower, he is willpower, he's getting totally obliterated by Superboy Prime. It's almost not even a conflict here. It's almost not even a battle. It's just absolute destruction on an incredible scale. Not only that, we also sort of harken back to this origin story of Sodom, which is actually really, really amazing. And again, it really focuses on this idea that over the course of their existence on Daxum, the, the inhabitants, as they call themselves Daxamites, eventually became afraid of anything that didn't hail from their planet. And so the result is that they became extremely isolated from the rest of the universe and never really traveled outside their own planet. Now, the idea of Sodom as he existed was that he was a kid who basically looked to the stars, always wanted the idea to achieve something greater. And so the overall goal here is that eventually he's met by an alien that crash lands on the planet. The two of them begin to talk and sort of, you know, exchange ideas and learn what the other's used to, only for Sodom's actions to be discovered by his parents, and then for this alien to basically be taken and to be killed, and then used as propaganda. At the same time, uh, Sodom's mind is just kind of wiped or at least modified, forcing him to come to the belief that the arrival of an alien would simply be the herald of destruction for their planet. Again, more or less brainwashing that's going on here, but where his parents had hoped that Sodom Yacht would basically abandon the idea of looking to the stars, you know, wanting to move beyond their planet and focus strictly on the role that his race was supposed to play. Instead, he basically said no, and it instilled in him an increasing fire to get outside of their world and to go see what was out there. But where he had finished building the ship, this basically coincided with the arrival of a Green Lantern ring because of his willpower, because of his ability to overcome fear, fear of the unknown, ultimately it led to him becoming a Green Lantern himself. Now again, the reason why this is important is because he has Kryptonian heritage and that's one of the things that he talks about. As he's commenting on this fight with uh, Superboy Prime, he starts to talk about the idea of you know, when he was basically met by the Guardians of the Universe, they said, look, you are part Kryptonian. When you're exposed to the yellow sun radiation of Earth's sun, you're going to start getting powers. But this is kind of cool because he doesn't have the ability to learn how to use those powers. I mean, if he, if he wasn't in the middle of a fight for his life against Superboy Prime, sure, Superman could sit him down and teach him how to, how to use the various abilities that he has, but he's basically learning what he's able to do as he's fighting. The problem with this is that he's facing off against Superboy Prime, and Superboy Prime has a wealth of experience under his belt. He fought during Crisis on Infinite Earths, which means that Superboy Prime had faced off against the Anti-Monitor. Superboy Prime had helped to instigate all the events of Infinite Crisis and has fought and defeated the entirety of Earth's superhero roster on two separate occasions. This is not some kid who's just kind of running a muck and being angsty. This is a kid that's got all kinds of problems, but he's also battle hardened. And so that's what makes this so cool is because despite the fact that Sodom Yacht does everything he can to try to face off against Superboy Prime, in the end, there's nothing he can do. He just cannot hold his own. The other reason why Sodom Yacht is so important is because it actually sort of transitions to this explanation or this discussion that takes place between uh, Ganthet and Saeed and the Earth's Green Lanterns, which is to say Hal Jordan, John Stewart, Guy Gardner, and Kyle Rayner. And what ends up happening here is Ganthet and 
Crusade basically reveal the idea of the prophecy of the Blackest Night. And this is why Sodom Yacht was so important, because if Sodom Yacht were to be killed by Superboy Prime, it would fulfill the first stage of the prophecy. Now, the prophecy of Blackest Night isn't necessarily the prophecy of the Black Lantern Rings, at least as it's given here. The prophecy of Blackest Night is the idea that there will basically be a rise of six new Lantern Corps in addition to the Green Lanterns. Now, one of the things that's established over the course of Jeff John's run is that these different Lantern Corps, some of them had existed for thousands and thousands of years, if not millions of years. Others are cropping up for the very first time. The Green Lanterns had existed since the time that the Guardians of the Universe made them, you know, however many thousands of years ago. With regards to the Star Sapphires, they'd existed for quite some time as well. The Red Lanterns, they existed for a pretty lengthy time. But when it came to the idea of the Sinestro Corps, that's still pretty new. Things like the uh, Orange Lantern Ring, you know, that one seems pretty new. The idea of the Blue Lantern Ring of Hope, that one hasn't even been made yet. But the overall prophecy is that all these lanterns, or all these lantern cores, these seven lantern cores, will eventually come together and they will engage in a conflict that will essentially lay waste to the entirety of all emotion across the universe. And so the prophecy of Blackest Night basically foretells a circumstance where all emotion across the universe will be totally gone. Now, in terms of what Blackest Night actually is as the story and what the prophecy really means, that all unfolds in the actual Blackest Night story itself, which is amazing. But the fact remains here that in the middle of this conflict, Ganthet and Sade basically kind of bail out. They're like, look, we're not allied with anyone particular to the Earth superheroes or so on. This is your fight. You guys have to go deal with it. We are essentially outcasts from the Guardians of the Universe. We're here to help or provide guidance, but not really here to fight. When it comes to all these different, you know, members of the Lantern Corps and the Sinestro Corps and the Green Lantern Corps facing off, in the end, this entire conflict really seems to kind of turn keel and face on the idea of the Anti-Monitor. And of course, the reason for this is because of the fact that with the Sinestro Corps members learning that the Green Lantern can now kill, that they've basically been authorized by the Guardians of the Universe to start killing Sinestro Corps members, some of them run. Some of them are just like, we gotta go. They just bail out. Others die in the conflict and some are still fighting. But the fact remains here that with the Anti-Monitor himself, he's the most credible threat. And the reason for this is because of the fact that the Anti-Monitor basically channels antimatter energy. And so it would be like if your left fist was antimatter and your right fist was positive matter and they punched, they would cancel each other out. And so the idea of the Anti-Monitor unleashing all this antimatter energy is to quite literally lay waste and completely obliterate the universe and then travel into the multiverse and do the same thing. And that's exactly what the Anti-Monitor would do. That's the reason why the Anti-Monitor allied itself with Sinestro was to be able to achieve this goal because Sinestro basically said, look, we'll clear the landscape of superheroes and we'll allow you to go do your own thing. The other half of this is that even with the superheroes facing off against Anti-Monitor as best they can, they still can't hold their own. Now, of course, with Kyle Rayner being freed of Parallax, with Hal Jordan being freed, uh, freed of Parallax and all these different guys, this basically leads to several fights all coinciding at the same time. For example, with the idea of War World, basically this giant planet, this forward operating base of sorts that's used by Sinestro for the purpose of allowing his forces to muster into a single location and then launch an attack on Earth, it's essentially this massive powerhouse of energy because on War World resides the Sinestro Core central power battery, basically the source of all their energy. And so it's basically this massive bomb, this massive explosive device. And so the idea of the Green Lanterns is to use this to basically hit the anti-monitor with the full brunt of all fear across the universe and then hope to obliterate him in the process. At the same time, because of the fact that Kyle Rayner and, uh, and and Hal Jordan's rings have lost their power, owing to the fact that the Manhunter robots have the ability to absorb Green Lantern energy, this also leads to all these different things kind of winding down and coming to a close. For example, with Hank Henshaw, when this massive war world bomb is dropped on the Anti-Monitor, or at least it's hit into him, the idea of Hank Henshaw is that he'll finally be able to die. And that's one of the most tragic things about this, because remember, when Hank Henshaw basically became Cyborg Superman before the events of the death of Superman leading into the events after the death of Superman, he was a non-remorseful being. All he wanted to do was just destroy things. But the idea was that he had basically been faced with the notion that he had lost everything he loved and cared about when he became Cyborg Superman. And so he'd essentially been on this quest to die. And the idea was that he had allied himself with the Anti-Monitor and Sinestro because the Anti-Monitor said, when this is all done, I will kill you. You will finally be freed of your imprisonment. And so it was kind of an ironic thing because ultimately it's the Green Lanterns that seem to be engineering the process by which Cyborg Superman 
Man Will Die when he puts him in the, the direct path of the explosion of War World hitting the anti-monitor. And so it was really kind of a bittersweet little thing. It's actually kind of a, a, an interesting little moment here. But with Sinestro sort of coming down with the intention of using his lantern ring to take out Kyle Rayner, to take out Hal Jordan, they in turn reprogram one of these uh, Manhunter robots and absorb the, the yellow lantern energy of Sinestro. Now, this is not a great big huge thing, but what it does do is it allows for a direct hand-to-hand -hand fight between the three of these guys. And the reason why this is important is because, remember, Sinestro had been a longtime enemy of Hal Jordan. They had fought for years and years and years and years. But when Hal Jordan declared himself Parallax, essentially killed Sinestro, only for Sinestro to basically survive the experience to be resurrected, and then in turn become an enemy of Kyle Rayner, this is the one theme that both have in common. Kyle Rayner and Hal Jordan have both called Sinestro their mortal enemy. And so it's really just kind of like this knockdown, drag out fight between the three of them. At the same time, Superboy Prime is taking no prisoners. I mean, it's, it's one of the coolest things because you've got Superman, you've got Power Girl, you've got all these different superheroes who were there doing the best they can to hold him back. And at the end of the day, none of it matters. He's still able to take out almost every last one of them. Because remember, you're talking about a character who's more powerful than any current version of Superman, who's faster than any current version of Superman, who's stronger. You know, he has more endurance. He has a, a higher level of durability. And there's no green kryptonite and no red, you know, no red sun within the immediate vicinity. He's virtually unstoppable. But the cool thing about this is that in the middle of all that, he basically gets more than he bargained for. And the reason why is because due to his arrogance and his hubris, one of the Guardians of the Universe sets upon him and then self-destructs. And this makes sense because remember, the Guardians of the Universe are insanely powerful and it was really required for them to act because if they hadn't stepped in and stopped Superboy Prime, none of it would have mattered. Superboy Prime would have destroyed every single Green Lantern. He would have destroyed every single superhero and there's nothing that they could have done to stop him. They'd be virtually powerless. I mean, it, it would it would have been the end of all things and he almost guaranteed to kill Sodom Yacht. And so it would have set in motion the death of almost everything in existence. And so what ends up happening here is that with the battle basically winding down, Jeff Johns, uh, the writer of the story, begins the process of going through and sort of bringing all these different themes to a close, but also setting the stage for the next set of events. Remember, Ganthet and Sade, despite the fact that they are guardians of the universe, are separate from the rest of the guardians. They've been outcasts because they, one, did not agree with what the guardians were doing, and two, worked against the other guardians of the universe. And so the result is that they basically kind of go off and they do their own thing. At the same time, it's also a bit of reconciliation between the various superheroes and the Green Lanterns and helping humanity sort of get past everything. But it's also the idea that Superboy Prime had basically been shunted out of the existing universe and sent to a whole nother universe in its entirety. And so again, it almost seems like he's basically been sent back to his home place. But the issue is that during the events of Countdown to Final Crisis, I think it is, it's going to show that he's actually been sent to a whole different universe, which is leads to a whole nother set of events. But the other gist of this is that with Ganthet and Sade looking around and realizing that in the midst of all this, that somebody's going to basically have to have the ability to help out the Green Lanterns to offer themselves as kind of a support group if it's necessary, the two of them in turn bond their energies and form the Blue Lanterns, the Lantern Corps of Hope. And so again, this is how all this stuff begins to build, that where Sinestro Corps begins to wind down, it's almost like these peaks and valleys. You know, you see this story starting to wind down into a valley, only for the ending to begin winding up into a peak. And we end up finding these things out because of the fact that the Manhunter robots track down the remains of Hank Henshaw and basically resurrect him. And it's one of the saddest things ever because where he believed that he was going to be free of this life, that he was going to be dead, he's instead brought back to life. He cannot ever truly die. His Manhunter robots will always keep him going. But the big jaw-dropping moment in this particular part of the story and the one that really just kind of left people flabbergasted was the fate of the Anti-Monitor. The Anti-Monitor is a being that is so incredibly powerful that he just can't be destroyed through conventional means. It would take basically the god of the DC universe, the presence, to really just kind of destroy him in its entirety. But the idea is that the Anti-Monitor still resides within the realm of the quote-unquote afterlife, or at least what passes for the afterlife in the DC universe, and is still hell-bent on achieving its goal of taking over everything, only for him to be transmogrified into the singular power source for the Black Lantern Rings themselves. But with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Sinestro Core War was amazing, but it only gets better from here. That's the craziest thing. I feel like it only just keeps uh, keeps getting better and better, especially with Blackest Night, with Brightest Day. It gets pretty insane. But I will catch you all later. Peace.